Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here at the, uh, at the Naval War College. And um, this is a very difficult subject to uh, wrap up in a short period of time, but I'm gonna do my best. Uh, I have my wife and timekeeper over there. Uh, I'm gonna talk for uh, a half an hour. And uh, when I go over that, I always go over. Uh, she's going to signal me and then I'm going to spend the rest of the time answering your questions and receiving applause and stuff. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody disagrees with me. Anyway, the title of this book is Revolution on the Hudson, New York City and the Hudson River Valley in the American War of Independence. Um, but the book itself is about the entire war because uh, in my estimation, the Hudson uh, influenced the entire war. The war hinged on, uh, on the Hudson, just as General Washington thought it would, just as uh, King George thought it would. Uh, one thing that the British and the Americans agreed on was that the Hudson was the key to uh, uh, the war. And uh, I, um, I'm going to start by, by pointing to the two key battles of the war. One, Saratoga, uh, which there were really two battles of, uh, at Saratoga. The last one was October 7, uh, 1777. And uh, the second battle is the Battle of Yorktown, which you're also familiar with, and that was uh, October 19, uh, 1781. Now it's it's obvious that the Battle of Saratoga uh, is part, it has to be part of the story if it's about if it's about the Hudson and the American Revolution. It's not so obvious that Yorktown uh, is also linked uh, to the Hudson uh, very substantially. So I am going to try to make out the case that uh, the uh, British obsession. With the, with the Hudson River Valley uh, played a key role in their losing Yorktown. So my book it, it won't be released until June 14. I'm, I'm waiting for my critics because this is a new way of looking at the war. And there's a lot of guys out there uh, who, uh, who uh, study and, and write about the war. So we'll see what they have to say about this outlandish point that I, uh, I am uh, making. Okay, so let me go back and explain why uh, the Hudson was so important, New York City and Hudson was so important. It's because it was the start of a uh, land sea corridor from, from New York to uh, Canada. Uh, and when the British uh, war planners uh, in London were looking at the map, they said, they thought, well, we just cut off the colonies, the northern colonies in New England from the south, uh, and we've won the war because the, the, the uh, most radical part of the revolution, the radicals are concentrated in New England. So if we can create a, a uh, sort of barrier uh, from New York City up to um, Quebec, uh, then uh, we, will have, we will have won the war. And this is gonna be easy to do because we already control Canada. Uh, we already have the, uh, the Royal Navy. And so the plan was, their, their, their war plan, uh, was to, to uh, have two armies, uh, one, one coming from New York in the south up to Albany and one coming down from Canada uh, to meet at Albany. So they, these two armies were gonna meet at Albany and this miraculously was gonna cut off New England uh, from, uh, from the colonies to the south, which were not so rapidly uh, anti-British uh, as, as the New Englanders were, and this would end the, uh, end the revolution. Simultaneously with the, with the meeting of these two armies, the British Navy would have a, uh, imposed a tight blockade along the, uh, along the New England coast and really seal off New England. This was their, this was their vision. Now, interestingly enough, 
uh, all of the policymakers in Britain and all of the policymakers in the United States thought this was true, that the British could do this and it would indeed um, win the war. Not only that, uh, every historian writing about the war, and they began writing about it almost, almost when, it was, it, it, when it was finished, till this present day have thought that, yeah, if the British were able to do that, they would have won the war. Uh, one of the people who was most, most influ influential in agreeing with this was uh, our own Admiral Mahan, uh, who uh, in, his, um, in his thinking simply agreed with, uh, with everybody else. So uh, in my book, I'm saying that this was never possible was never possible for the British uh, to, uh, um, to do this for lots of reasons, but primarily because uh, there was no political dimension to their strategy. Uh, and New York was divided politically. Uh, the the um, counties around New York uh, were pro-British, uh, not 100 percent, but uh, a majority of the people uh, were pro-British. Stat Staten Island was probably 90 percent British. Westchester County was probably half-half. Uh, so once you went north of Westchester County, these counties were uh, very similar in their political thinking to, to New England. Uh, and so uh, the strength of, of, of the uh, defenders let's say, was going to come from these anti-British colonies just as they had at Lexington and Concord and in large numbers. So if we come to the Battle of Saratoga, for instance, uh, what defeated Burgoyne, the British, the British general, uh, was the fact that the whole countryside was up in arms against him and that hundreds, then thousands of militiamen uh, were were um, were turning out to be, make uh, become uh, join the American army. Um, the American army at Saratoga, uh, when the decisive battle was fought, was fifteen thousand. Burgoyne's army had dwindled uh, to around six thousand. These these numbers are uh, uh, more or less okay. We never have any exact figures on on these. Any it, the, 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 Anyway, don't, that's a, a separate subject of mine. But anyway, be skeptical of all historical numbers. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, roughly what it was. And Burgoyne wrote back to, to London. He said, uh, I, I don't have any support here. We were looking for, for loyalists to join my army. They never appeared. But the Americans appeared, appear by the thousands, he said. This is Burgoyne. This is the British general. This is why he thought he got defeated. And this is why he... Uh, he did get defeated. So what was missing from British strategy was, was it w there was no political element to it. They thought they could, they could uh, take over this area and defeat the Americans with military force alone. It was too big a territory. There were too many of us. Uh, and uh, in addition, they wanted to do it on the cheap. They never wanted to commit the, the forces necessary uh, to accomplish uh, 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 what, what I don't think they would have ever accomplished. They could never have defeated us with just an army and navy alone with no, with no uh, political dimension. Okay. Uh, I want to fast forward to Yorktown, and I'll fill in between if you want. But uh, Yorktown is October 19, 1780. One. How is uh, this br f flawed British strategy connected uh, with Yorktown? To me, uh, Yorktown had two key elements. One was a naval battle, September 5, uh, 1781, off the Chesapeake uh, Capes. The other was a, a land, a land uh, uh, battle, um, and uh, uh, that was the final one, October, uh, October 19th. Now the British lost the the uh, the naval battle to the French on September five, and 
I believe the reason they lost the battle is because they didn't have their best, best admiral, who was George Romney, in charge of the fleet. Where was Rodney? Rodney, of course, was in Bath. What was he doing in Bath? Having a good time. What else do they do? Uh, I mean, not Bath, Maine, but Bath, uh, you, un you understand. Um, Rodney, Rodney, the previous year, uh, had been uh, uh, in, um, in New York. Um, and I, I I'll come back to, if you want, why I thought Rodney would have won the battle off the capes of uh, Chesapeake Capes against the, against the French. But uh, why wasn't he there? He should have been there because uh, he was, uh, at that moment, he was head of the British fleet in America and the West Indies, both. It was a combined, uh, uh, it was a combined command. Uh, in 1780, he had been in New York. In September of, uh, of 1780, uh, he, he just appeared in New York uh, with 10, with ten uh, ships of the line. Uh, they weren't expecting him, but it gave the British then unexpectedly a, an overwhelming force right in New York right then. And guess what was happening then? General Arnold was turning over West Point right then. Uh, so Rodney arrived just as Arnold was about to, uh, about to turn over West Point. And General Clinton, who was the head of the British uh, Army in North America, headquartered in, uh, in New York. Now, good old General Clinton was a difficult man to, to get along with. I'm not going to call him a no difficult. He had to work with another admiral, his, his naval counterpart called Arbuthnot. And if Clinton was difficult to get along with, you never met Arbuthnot. The two of them hated each other terribly. Uh, so here, here Clinton is wondering what the hell's going to happen uh, when Arnold turns over West Point and he cannot get his troops from New York up the river because Arbuthnot isn't cooperating. How do you like that? And that was, a, that was what was going to happen uh, until Rodney showed up. And when Rodney showed up, it saved Clinton. It was going to make the whole turnover of West Point uh, possible now for, for, uh, for Clinton. Um, Rodney had no idea any of this was, was in the works. Uh, and when he landed, uh, he was overjoyed to find out all of the stuff that was happening because he was now going to win the whole War of Independence. He, he was going to win the war. Uh, he, he, thought that, he thought that the old British strategy of cutting off New England was absolutely the, the right thing to do. Clinton thought so too, and they thought if they captured West Point, they would then control all of the Hudson, and somehow or other, miraculously, they would control uh, the whole land-sea corridor all the way up to Canada. Okay, Rodney bought that completely. All right, and he's all set to go. I mean, he's, he's all pumped up, and, and they have the troops and everything, and Arnold's ready, and you know how capable Arnold was. I know Arnold was very capable. So, um, Arnold, you, you know that Arnold got captured. I mean, Arnold got discovered, but uh, Washington couldn't catch Arnold. Arnold got back to New York. So uh, this is in September now of 1780. When Arnold gets back to New York, uh, what's the first thing he wants to do? This guy is a great political operator, Arnold. Uh, he wants to make friends with Rodney. And he wants to make friends with, with Clinton, which he does very quickly. Rodney falls in love with Arnold. Rodney loves Arnold. Uh, so Rodney says, OK, well, let's go. Nothing has changed. Uh, uh, let's go and attack West Point, and we will win the war. Seemed seem reasonable. And Clinton himself had been advocating this for a very long time. And then all of a sudden, Clinton uh, says no. 
I'm not going to. I'm not going to go ahead. Uh, this the whole business is is ruined. Washington's going to uh, be uh, ha be able to have enough strength there to foil us. So Clinton stops this whole operation that Rodney thinks uh, would have would have won the war because he he was totally. Uh, uh, a, a, believe, a believer in the old strategy of cutting off uh, New England. Okay, let's go back to Yorktown now. Okay, because Rodney goes back to west to the um, to the West Indies, uh, very very mad and angry. He writes a lot of letters to to uh, to uh, London, saying you got to get rid of Clinton, you got to get rid of Arbuthnoth, get some better leaders there. Uh, okay, so now. Uh, Yorktown is only the next year, and um, Rodney uh, is thinking that, that the British fleet in the West Indies has got to come up to the uh, Atlantic coast again, just like he did uh, the previous year. Uh, and and uh, they believe that the, the way things are uh, configured, that there's going to be a showdown finally with the French in 1781. It's either going to be in the Chesapeake or uh, in New York, and Rodney should be leading the British uh, fleet. Okay. Rodney decides he doesn't want any part of this. Okay. He's not coming. He's not coming. So he creates a, what I think is a phony excuse and, and is allowed by the Admiralty to go home. And he leaves com command, which results in leaving command of the, of the British fleet in America to a, a guy who, under the circumstances, really cannot defeat the French. He just is, does, doesn't have the ability to, and he doesn't, and the British lose uh, the battle off the Virginia Capes, which result in the loss of, uh, of Yorktown. Uh, Rodney himself, when he reads about what, this, what his replacement uh, did uh, at the battle in September 5, is furious. I wouldn't have done this. I would have done it differently, and so on and so on. And he would have. Uh, his his uh, he, in my estimation, would have uh, defeated the uh, the French admiral, and the whole war would have would have gone uh, differently. So Rodney didn't get mixed up with all of this. Uh, he went home. Why? Because he had bought that the whole mythology of the of the Hudson River Valley that the British had that if they took West Point, they'd, they'd win the war. They control the valley, they control the corridor to Canada, uh, which in my estimation is an illusion. So this is the connection I, ma I make between Saratoga and Yorktown. So there. Um, so I, I uh, how are we doing on the time? Fine. Fine? Okay. Um, what time is it actually? 1220. 1220, okay. Let me, let me just a little bit more on, on the war. I, in this book, uh, I start really in uh, 1776. Uh, I also go back and, and have something to say about 70, 1775 too. So the book, and I, I, have, I have something to say about what happened after Yorktown. So the book is a book about the whole, a whole war. But the British the British learned the lesson in 1775. In 1775, they got their tail whipped, as you know, in a number of battles. Lexington and Concord was, uh, was just the beginning. And the reason they did is they didn't commit enough troops. They always thought they were going to uh, uh, defeat the, the American patriots on the cheap. Uh, to begin with, in Lexington and Concord, they had less than 4,000 troops uh, in, uh, in Boston. And half of them had to be used to keep the people in Boston down. So they had, they had like 2,000 troops they were sending into a countryside uh, that, that uh, turned out 20,000 militiamen, okay? Uh, so they, they, the king learned his lesson, he thought, in 1776. And he committed 32,000 to the invasion of New York, which began in August of uh, of 70, 1776, and the Canadian army that was coming down from Canada was 10,000, so it was 42,000. 
General Amherst, who had, who had won the uh, French and Indian War for the British here, thought you needed at least 75,000. Uh, I don't think 75,000 was enough. Benjamin Franklin thought, well, you need a lot more than that. Uh, but anyway, it turned out that the, the getting together the 42,000, 10 from the north, 32,000 from the south, um, it just wasn't going to do it. And, and the, the, two, the two commanders, British commanders, in New York recognized this. Admiral, uh, Admiral Howe, the, uh, the Navy chief, and um, General Howe, who was the, the Army chief, they originally thought that, yeah, th this number will be enough. There weren't enough, the fl fleet wasn't big enough either. Uh, so, but as they got into it, they could see that, that uh, this, was, this was, they were, was woefully inadequate. So uh, at the end of, of 17, uh, uh, 1776, um, General Howe sent, sent home a new plan, a new strategy for 1777. 1777, uh, he thought that he now knew how to win the war. Uh, you know, the, in those days, you didn't fight in, uh, in the wintertime, and besides which, he'd like to have a good time in New York, uh, which he did. Uh, and, uh, and so he, he came back out in, in, uh, to do battle in, in the spring of 1777, but the king was having no part of, of increasing the army anywhere near the extent that Howe believed he needed, and I think Howe was, Howe was right. Uh, and the, uh, the first sea lord, the guy who, who ran, the, uh, ran the navy for the British, uh, he, th he thought that the fleet was just fine the way it was, uh, and they, they, they didn't need uh, any more. Uh, and so the whole operation in, in 1777, which was a replay of 1776 for the British, failed. Guess who the king blamed? Not the strategy. He blamed the general and the admiral, and uh, he blamed the people carrying it out, not not his uh, his uh, his vision. So, um, so far as the strategy this strategy is concerned, it's sort of it's sort of put on the side because the French came into the war because of Sarat the, the victory at Saratoga in 1777. The French come into the war, and, and so it becomes a world war, and so the strategy uh, changes. Nonetheless, there's all these people, including Clinton, and then later Rodney, who still are saying, if we only carried out the old, the old strategy, it never disappeared. It wasn't, was in, uh, it wasn't still had a, it lived on. They thought, if it only we had gotten to Albany, can you imagine getting to Albany? What, anyway. Um, so uh, once the French come in, uh, it makes it possible for for the United States to actually defeat the uh, uh, British, which, because of their own uh, internal feuding, uh, was accomplished at uh, at Yorktown. If you knew if you knew the the American army and what a, a what it had deteriorated into by 1781, uh, you, you would wonder how could we possibly uh, carry on without the French? Well, we couldn't. Uh, and the British, the British simply, if they had stayed here and waited us out, uh, would have, uh, we uh, uh, would have, uh, uh, would have, uh, won, I can't say won the war because the war would have stopped uh, and uh, there would have been a negotiation between the French and the British, and Lord knows how that would have uh, would have turned out. But if if the British divided the territory somehow or other with the French, whatever Britain controlled sooner or later, later on, they were going to make the same mistakes that had brought about Lexington and Concord, and the whole thing was going to start up again. Finally, George Washington. <coughs> I've studied George Washington for a very long time, and uh, he, in my estimation, was one of the greatest leaders 
in world history. If you ask me to name the six most important figures in world history, he'd be one of them. If you, if you examine what he did up close during the revolution all this time, not to mention what he did afterwards, but just, just that holding all of this together. I mean, he was holding it together. Uh, he was amazing. And uh, he was a great writer. He had written so many letters uh, that uh, he had developed a great facility uh, uh, with the language. And he, all of his correspondence during the war boils down to 10, 10 volumes. Uh, we've had three versions of them. I have the first one uh, that was published in the 1840s. Um, and I've read them all and I'm astonished at what a great, uh, great writer he, uh, he was. And his wife I want to kill. <laughs> if, there's, if there's anyone I want to uh, dig up and shoot again, it's her. Because, because naturally he wrote wonderful letters to her. And they were a wonderful couple. You know, and she joined him every, every year uh, in, in the wintertime, in, in the most awful circumstances in the battlefield. She then goes and burns all of their letters. Every blessed one of them except for two. And the two of them are fantastic. So she I'm going to get. <laughs> I don't know how. All right. So I'll stop there and answer, answer any questions you have. See no questions that answered all the questions. Do you address the various battles around the New York area? There were yeah. many and they lost them all. I, I mean the Americans lost them all, I think. I do. I go through I go through every battle. Yes. But uh, there's n uh, nothing original uh, that I have to say about those battles. Uh, I hope I'm accurate, but there are guys who have studied them in great detail. Uh, and um, if you want to know specific battles, um, my, my, my uh, summary might be a refresher course for you. Uh, I uh, have spent uh, really over 20 years studying this uh, business. I'm a grind. Uh, and uh, so um, I think I, I have a very good summary. But um, that's what it is. Okay, like the Battle of Brooklyn, uh, which is one of the great battles of our, of our history, which we uh, which we lost. I described that, but there are other, many other people who describe it in, in, in greater detail. Uh, one of the things that I uh, emphasize in the book is um, uh, prisoners, how the British treated American prisoners, and I have a, I have a nice section in, uh, in the Battle of Brooklyn about what they did with those prisoners, but there are other books, uh, not too many about the prisoners. Uh, we're so close to the British uh, that we don't like to think about what they did to our prisoners, and what they did was a war crime. Uh, uh, there were 30,000 American prisoners, and they killed half of them. Um, and uh, there's, I mean, there's no blinking it. You know, this is this happened. Washington was after them to uh, stop it right from the beginning. Uh, letter after letter, it didn't, it didn't have any uh, effect. John Adams, you name it. Um, so. Uh, um, I, I, have, I have attached that to every, every, every uh, battle, uh, what happened to the prisoners. Yeah? If you say that uh, Burgoyne's movement down there was both a tactical and strategic mistake, both for losing and for strategically bringing the French in, what would you have done with those 8,000 troops had you, if you don't think the Hudson was of any value, what would you have done with those 8,000 troops? Um, he, he, I would have brought him home. I would have, I would have, uh, I would have brought all the troops home. Uh, in 1775, uh, uh, they had uh, 4,000 troops in Boston. I would have brought those 4,000 troops home. Uh, one of the great uh, English statesmen, William Pitt, who who ran who ran the French and Indian War in England and won the French and Indian War. When, when the time came, crunch time came in 1775 when the government was making up its mind about whether or not they were going to negotiate with the Americans or they were going to go for, for force, a military, uh, military option. 
uh, he, sa he said to the king, take the troops out of Boston and talk with them. The, the issues can be resolved. Uh, if you go to fighting, uh, it's going to be very iffy. There are a lot of them. Uh, they know how to fight. They fought well during the French and Indian War, despite what your, uh, what your British officers uh, will tell you. They're not afraid of your troops. And there's just, you know, there's tens of thousands. I mean, how many Americans would turn out? So that was his advice, and it was good advice. Uh, and, and we never would have had that. And, and we would have had a British America happily. The, 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 the uh, people uh, who fought the British at Lexington and Concord, okay, those, those guys and women, the women were a big part of that story. Um, uh, they had the highest standard of living in the world, okay, of any ordinary people in, in, uh, in the whole world. They did not want to fight. They were living quite well. Uh, it, it, would, it would have been very easy to negotiate with their Continental Congress, which they, uh, with the, which they uh, produced. This was a war that never should have been fought. There are wars like that, as uh, you know. We won't get into that. But, uh, but uh, um, so that's not what you wanted to hear. Uh, <laughs> here's, what, here's, what, here's what Burgoyne thought. Burgoyne thought that he would get to Albany quickly. Uh, he thought that uh, he, that all these loyalists, these, this mythical uh, army of loyalists would come to join him. Uh, he might get together uh, 15, even 20,000 troops himself, you know, without reference to the army coming up from New York. Uh, he'd base himself in Albany. Uh, he'd have plenty to eat there, and he would take that army and march into Massachusetts and Connecticut. There would be loyalists that would join him, and he would win the war on his own. Uh, and uh, he thought in 1777 that uh, by Christmas time, anyway, that he would be the victor and the great, the, you know, he would be the, the Nelson and the Wellington and so on, the great hero of, of that. So that's, that's what he, he thought. Uh, I think that was a pipe dream. Can you imagine if he took these people into Massachusetts and you had, had all the farmers coming out again and from Connecticut and then the farmers from New York and all, the, all, the, uh, uh, all, all of them north of uh, Westchester County and how big the, that army would be. He'd be fighting for a while there. Yeah? Yes, sir, so I was wondering, kind of leapfrog, you know, on the first question. So it sounds like what you, if I follow what you said, you're suggesting that uh, although this, a central premise of your book is that the misguided strategy of control of the Hudson would lead to winning the war was a, was a fallacy, I think you're implying perhaps that there wasn't a better alternative strategy that would have worked, but, but in fact the waging of war in the first place was the wrong tool to achieve the political objectives that they wanted. Is that about? Absolutely. Okay. That's what William Pitt thought. And uh, who could disagree with William Pitt? <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's, 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 it's hard to think of that, you know, and all the waste on both sides. And uh, it, it's like brothers fighting. It was, uh, some people call it a cousin's war and so on. So it's hard to think that it was un just unnecessary with stupid leadership, but. Uh, comment on Burgoyne's pipe dream. It, the problem, of course, is that loyalists pay taxes to the king for the king to hire an army to protect them. They're not going to volunteer to go out and fight after they pay taxes. To exactly. Taxes exactly. That's a very good point. The, the British found out uh, all over in the South, same thing. You know, what do you mean we got to fight for you? <laughs> what, do, what do we have you for? My question was, I was wondering if you had looked forward to the War of 1812 and the, and the same strategy that the British looked at um, during the War of 1812. Well, I, I uh, wrote a book on the War of 1812. You've got to get that book. It's just, it just, it just, it just I came at the wrong time. <laughs> well, that was, that was four years ago. And, and uh, even, even John Hattendorf stayed awake for that. So. So, uh, so you never know. Um, 
I, I hate to get off in the War of 1812, but, but uh, the, the, the British, it seemed, you know, emotionally, uh, were mad at us. We, they never got over the War of Independence. And uh, the, the War of 1812 almost seemed inevitable at some, at some point. But their whole, their whole inability to respect us militarily, uh, which was very evident in 1774 and 1775, strangely continued on uh, up to, the, um, up to uh, 1812. I mean, all the things that they did to us uh, leading up to the war to make us angry enough to actually declare war on, uh, on them was, was an outgrowth of the fact that they didn't, they didn't respect us uh, militarily. Well, we had been debating ourselves whether or not to even have a navy uh, for all of this time. Our navy in, 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 the, in the Revolutionary War had done very poorly. Uh, there was no Navy after the Revolutionary War until 1794. Uh, and then there was a great debate in this country about whether or not we ought to even have a Navy. And the, the irritation with the British was primarily on the, uh, on the water. So um, they didn't respect us uh, because we couldn't make up our mind, did we want a, a, a strong Navy? Do we want a strong army or not? You know, uh, because a lot of our political thinkers thought that uh, it, uh, having a strong military would be dangerous. Uh, it, would, it would, you know, some man on horseback would become, a, would become a dictator. So the War of 1812 surprised them that we did so well, particularly on the water, even with uh, the minuscule uh, navy we had. And the British leadership of that time, uh, the prime minister was Liverpool and the foreign minister was Castlereagh. Uh, they were, they felt towards the Americans as, as everybody else did. They had no respect for them militarily. But during the war, uh, during the war, and, and I, I could mention a number of places where the Americans unexpectedly won, but New Orleans is a good example. Um, Castlereagh uh, said that, you know, if we don't make a real peace with these people, uh, we're going to be fighting them for the next hundred years. Uh, just think of it. The whole border with Canada. Uh, we're going to be this, you know, you can, uh, how about the southern uh, border? How about the sea and so on? All these, all these things. So he, he got Liverpool. Liverpool was, in, was a, uh, he, should, he should have been running today. He was the kind of politician who knew exactly what button to push to, uh, to get uh, public support. So, uh, he got, he got Liverpool to, su to support a total revolution in British policy towards the United States at the end of the war uh, of, uh, of 1812. And from there, then on, uh, they treated us with respect. And guess what? James Madison, who was the president and who had been one of the people back in 1794 who did not want a navy, and wanted a very small army, uh, he had changed his mind too. He thought if we don't have a respectable force, uh, look what's going to happen to us, okay? He thought we need a respectable force in order to protect the Constitution. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a threat to it. So the American military for the first in, uh, time, well, anyway, the American military was not disbanded at the end of the war, uh, and uh, certainly not the Navy. Uh, we, uh, he we, we kept the Navy, and that's really uh, a lot of guys in the Navy. Uh, Admiral, Admiral Granite, who, who loved my book, uh, thought that uh, the uh, War of 1812 was enormously important in the history of the Navy because of uh, our, our, our country finally agreed we need a strong Navy. That's that's pretty long-winded answer to a very simple question, right? Now. I'm I'm sorry. Can you imagine being married to me? I mean, she's already. F yeah. So you're saying Admiral Rodney was committed to the strategy uh, of dividing uh, along the Hudson. Yeah, and he didn't know anything about it. He didn't know anything about the United States, but he he bought that whole thing, and you know who was encouraging him, Arnold. 
Arnold, when Arnold got to New York, he made a, a point of getting close to Rodney, and Rodney, Rodney fell in love with him, literally. Uh, and uh, Arnold convinced him that this whole strategy uh, would, uh, would work. So he was committed to the strategy, but he still didn't want to have anything to do with engaging the French fleet? Uh, off of well, no, he, he wanted to engage the French fleet, but he didn't want to do it personally because he'd be working with Clinton. Clinton was the guy in 1780 uh, who, who stopped him from taking West Point. Rodney thought that he and Arnold would easily take. They had the troops there, they had them on the transports, uh, you know. Uh, the, the, the Americans were, were discombobulated by what happened with, uh, with Arnold. Arnold was a great general. He was a, uh, he was a guy who, uh, I mean, he was a strange character in love, I would, I would say in love with uh, money uh, more than anything else, but he was, he was a very, very good military leader and Rodney had a lot of respect for him. Rodney himself was uh, one of the greatest uh, fighters ever. So uh, yeah, they would have probably taken West Point. Uh, Arnold thought it would have taken about 10 days. Uh, and uh, then what would happen? You know, uh, beyond that what happens? Well, it gets a little fuzzy, but West Point, they thought that was the, they, they really thought that once they took West Point, Washington would just give up. That was, that was the hope. Yes, sir. Were there some historical cases that they were thinking about then that made this so compelling an idea for them? Um, Were they looking back in history, whether it was back to classical period? Oh, no, 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 no. Lord knows what they were looking at. I, I, can't, I, I can't answer that question. It, it, uh, the distance between New York City and Albany and the distance between Albany and Montreal and, 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 and uh, so on and so on, and the size of the, uh, the Royal Navy. Uh, and one, one of the great, greatest uh, naval leaders was Admiral uh, Lord Howe, who was the uh, fleet commander uh, here at that time. He, 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 he didn't say so publicly, but he, uh, he, thought, he thought that whole strategy was foolish. You know, he never, he never wrote about it, so this is just a supposition of mine, but um, he wasn't surprised that any of this uh, had happened. They let him go. It was a really odd thing. They're really their best admiral. El Nelson called Howe the best admiral they ever had. Nelson. Uh, and and the, 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 first, the first sea lord, the head of the, uh, the uh, navy, Sandwich, didn't like Howe. Okay? He didn't like him, Howe, for a lot of reasons. Um, but um, he made life difficult for Howe. Uh, and Howe Howe went, went back home, uh, and Sandwich, Sandwich was very happy to have him uh, go back home in, in the fall of 1778, okay? If Howe had been kept on, he probably would have won, he, 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 he would have been better equipped than Rodney even to win the battle off the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Capes. The, the, the uh, war leaders in London were so smart, they were happy to have Howe come back. So, but Howe was never in love with that strategy, no. But if you ask me to give you uh, evidence of this, then I would be too busy for you or something. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, yes ma'am. How large a fleet? What? How large a fleet did the British bring over? How many ships did they have over here? Lord Howe had, uh, when he first came uh, in uh, 1776, uh, he had about 70 warships total. But they were coming and going all the time, you know, they were breaking down, you had to fix them and so on. We had limited facilities here. Halifax was, was uh, very, uh, very limited in what it could do. Some of them often had to go uh, back, to, back to, uh, uh, to England. 72 was not, not near enough. I list in my book, the things that the Admiralty tasked how to do with these 72 ships it was ridiculous. Um, and uh, at no time in the war did the British have more than 90 warships here. And it just wasn't enough. You know, it seemed to be enough. You know, that's a lot of, a lot of ships, but um, it just wasn't. This is a big country. 
Um, it was two and a half million people. Uh, 500,000 of those were slaves, but still there's two million people. And the slaves, as the war went on, became part of our armies, um, except for um, places like South Carolina. South Carolina would never have slaves become part of the army, but the other, the other colonies uh, would. So the, the, uh, the sheer size of, of the military to do what they wanted to do over here, uh, they just didn't want to come to, uh, to grips with that. It's like Lyndon Johnson trying to think how many troops were actually needed, or what was actually needed to uh, fight the war in Vietnam. I'm, I'm, I'm the Vietnam War era, okay? Don't get me going on that one. <laughs> That's another story, but it was, it was similar. The, it, it shouldn't draw parallels like these historical parallels, but uh, Johnson never, ever wanted to face the uh, political consequences of having, having the size of the military that he would have needed to uh, do what he, he wanted to do. Well, you guys must study the Vietnam. Do you study the Vietnam War here? Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. What triggered your interest to focus on so much time on the Revolutionary War? Um, well, my wife and I were in business for a long time. She's an artist. And uh, I, I was a college professor up until, the age of, uh, up until the age of 40 when I was totally burned out. And I went into her business. Uh, and uh, after 20 years of that, um, I, I decided I wanted to uh, spend my time writing again. When I was a professor, I had published three books and I wanted to go back to it. I got over being, uh, being burned out. And she wanted to, she got tired of the business and wanted to, uh, to uh, spend full time with her painting. But, uh, but uh, I, I knew that it was going to be a job. Uh, it was nice to have some money in the bank. You know, when you're a professor, you're broke. I mean, the, what they pay you is mind-boggling. Uh, uh, anyway, so we had the money, and, and uh, so we, uh, that's what I did. I studied, I studied for years and years and years. Uh, and then my first book uh, came out in 2008. And I, this is my fourth book. My fifth book will be out uh, at the end of next year, will be on Lexington and Concord. When I was a professor, I uh, wrote three books. Uh, one, uh, the, my first book was on the Cold War, and we sold a million copies. A million copies is a lot, you know. Uh, in this, this day and age, for, for uh, New York publishers who are only interested in money, uh, I shouldn't be so harsh on them, but uh, the benchmark for, for a history book like I write is like 10,000 copies, 10,000. They cover all expenses, and they'll cover your advance, and so on. Um, a million is, you know, uh, David McCullough has, sells a million. No, anyway, so the publisher thought, whoa, I'm going to, you know. So the next book didn't do so well. <laughs> 75,000 we sold, which is very, very good. He still made plenty of money. So he's going hot, and the next book uh, was on World War I. And he, he printed this humongous number in anticipation of uh, a big sales. He couldn't, we couldn't give them away. I mean, literally, literally couldn't give them away. No one was interested in those days in World War I. I don't know what the hell But anyway, after that defeat, I decided I didn't want to go out that way. I had to come back. Sorry. But the, the, uh, when I got into studying uh, early American history, the thing I noticed uh, right away was, where's the Navy? Navy's not in it. Uh, when, the, when historians uh, think about those ships and all the things they have to learn about them, they get stomach acid. They, they think they have to, <laughs> they think they have to uh, learn a new language, which they do. And the Navy is n not in these histories. I mean, it's amazing. And a little bit that is, is, is just, you know, would make you cry. And so our kids, grammar school all the way through, uh, are learning their history without the Navy in it. So you wonder why people don't know about the Navy and don't appreciate all the things the Navy has done. Uh, so I began to focus on, on the Navy and integrating the old story that we tell with the, with the naval story. But it's, uh, 
it's an up, uphill battle uh, because the, the amount of ignorance about the Navy, and of course the, uh, it would make you cry how little is known about what, how important the Navy's been since, since uh, to the world since World War II, you know? Uh, so anything we can do to, uh, to in the area of public awareness is, uh, is worth doing because uh, so surely, and it's very dangerous that the people don't know how important the Navy is, very dangerous, because there are things like budgets and all these people cutting budgets and so on can cut the wrong place. Um, what do we got here? All right, five minutes. Anyone want to want to refute what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Not about the Navy and public relations. That drives me crazy. That subject. Yeah. What was the influence of the Continental Congress? Um, Very similar to the Congress today. It would drive you crazy. Uh, the politicians, uh, politicians are politicians. They don't, uh, they don't change. They they represent the areas where they come from. Uh, and so far as the immoral character is concerned, uh, don't expect a high level of, uh, in that category. They represent who they represent. And they may think that their constituents are, are mistaken, but you'd never know that. You might hear it privately. There was a congressman who was a, a um, friend of mine uh, from, uh, Iowa named John Culver, the lady became a, a, a senator. Uh, and John Culver was, was uh, in, in the House of Representatives. He was a, a big proponent of foreign aid. Foreign aid was, uh, was, uh, was always controversial. But one guy from, I don't know, I don't know what state, I think it was Alabama. Uh, one guy gave him a particularly hard time always in the House when the bill, foreign aid bill, came up. This guy was 300% against foreign aid, but foreign aid would, all, would always pass nonetheless. But foreign aid got progressively uh, less popular, so each time it was voted, the vote got closer. So in this particular year, I forget the year, um, the foreign aid bill came up and they were, they were discussing it and the vote was about to happen, and this guy Mr. 300% against the foreign aid comes r rushing up to Culver and says to him, John, it might not pass. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, Culver, who was about as cynical as the rest of us, couldn't believe this one. And uh, he, he, he loved to tell that, uh, that story. So anyway, Congress back then is a mystery, and it's a mystery to, uh, it's about as, I, I understand about as much of it as I do uh, our current Congress. Um, the way we treated our military in those days, I have a little bit of it in the book, uh, you would not believe, okay? You just, you just wouldn't believe how badly we treated, and particularly our enlisted men. Uh, and, and this was all simply political, you know? These were the kids who fought the war all the way through, sacrificed everything. Uh, and uh, the way they treated, uh, they treated them well, they didn't pay them and all these, these things. It's a, it's a long, awful story, you know. But um, so, no, I don't think the, uh, I don't have any great admiration for the, uh, for the Congress. And I, I place a huge emphasis on, on Washington. Uh, and they always had Washington, you know, who, who uh, would do the right thing. Uh, but um, don't ask them to do the right thing. Well, look at, well, I'm. <laughs> yes, anything else? Thank you. All right.